Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's probably past time to um, share this information with people. It's been over a year since the paper came out and um, about 12 years since the rezoning actually occurred. So um, just up front, I want to um, just acknowledge that this is the work of a lot of people. Um, basically, all the members of the long-term monitoring team have contributed to this. Um, Aaron McNeil and Murray Logan, uh, statistical wizards that uh, probably this project wouldn't have happened without. And then also collaboration, people here at JCU um, and the Senate, Dave Williamson, Danny Ceccarelli, Rich Evans, and uh, the absent Professor Russ. So I think all of us <coughs> are well aware that coral reefs worldwide are under pressure. Uh, there's a raft of natural disturbances that um, cause impacts to reefs. We've got cyclones, there's a new wave of crown of thorns that started on the GBR, um, two large bleaching events uh, previously with one maybe pending at the moment and of course um, some chronic levels of background coral disease but on top of this we have uh, synergistic effects of uh, anthropogenic pressures as well coastal development's been in the news recently port developments and the associated um, pressures with dredging and um, so forth those direct impacts, but you also have uh, indirect impacts, like there's going to be increased ship traffic if these port developments go ahead, so um, there's the increased chance of ship groundings and problems there. Queensland, as we all know, it's a highly agricultural state. We have a very well-developed uh, sugarcane industry in uh, many of the catchments along the coast. This can cause uh, uh, increased sediment and nutrient loadings in uh, high rainfall runoff events. And then just to top it all off, everyone in Queensland loves to go out and have a fish. So there's a really well-developed uh, recreational and uh, commercial fishery, and this will kind of be um, basically the focus of what I'm looking at in this talk. So all of these pressures together, I'm sure we're all aware, uh, are causing degradation of reef ecosystems across the globe. Um, just a few examples. There was Terry's seminal work here in... Um, in Jamaica, which was symptomatic of a, a wider malaise in the Caribbean, we saw um, large declines in hard coral cover uh, across a decade and concomitant increases in algae. Uh, Jeff Jones and colleagues in Kimby Bay have documented a uh, decline of coral cover there, both inside and out of marine reserves. And uh, in one of the most used figures recently, um, we can see that the coral cover on the GDR has declined by about 50%. This was reported in the Diaphidel paper in 2012. So all of these pressures on coral reefs, they're causing degradation. Uh, you know, it's, it's a large concern to everyone, but what can we do to uh, alleviate some of this pressure and, and protect the biodiversity that's on these reefs? Well, one of the most advocated uh, tools that we have at our disposal is to implement uh, networks of no-take marine reserves or green zones as we know them here on the GDR. But I think we need to be a bit realistic about what we can expect marine reserves to achieve and I think these expectations really depend on the regional setting in which the reserves are found. For example, uh, you know, what type of fishery do they have um, around in the fished areas? Is it like one that uses destructive techniques like dynamite fishing? Uh, do they target a narrow range of species or do they target the whole assemblage? Similarly, uh, what levels of uh, enforcement and compliance are there? You know, is it well funded enough that um, the, uh, the rules are actually followed or are they just paper parts? Um, you know, what's the population density close to these reserves? And also, um, what sort of coastal land uses do you have? So, in the Great Barrier Reef context, you know, we're a wealthy, um, developed nation. We have um, well-developed fisheries. There's... Uh, net fisheries, different trawl fisheries and um, uh, line fisheries for pelagic species like mackerel. The one of great interest to us of course is the GBR uh, coral reef line fishery which targets a narrow range of these uh, top predators, the coral trout. I think we have barely adequate enforcement and compliance in the GBR. It's a very large area um, to patrol and there's limited funding to do so. And there's most definitely this problem of um, poaching that's going on inside green zones, just from personal experience. You see it on a very regular basis 
And of course, as I mentioned before, there's all sorts of coastal development and agriculture associated uh, in the catchments. So what would we expect from marine reserves in, given, this, um, given this context of the setting? Well, we can definitely expect them to protect exploited species and then to rebuild any stocks that have been degraded through overfishing. Uh, once the stocks are rebuilt, we can probably expect to see some export of adult fish and um, larval subsidies across marine reserve boundaries into adjacent fished areas. And there's also the question of what role can they play in um, helping reefs recover from environmental disturbances. And I think uh, the jury's well and truly out on that one. What we probably wouldn't expect from GVR green zones is uh, any differences in uh, benefit communities in the coral cover. Um, probably wouldn't expect differences in non-target fish species uh, unless you're invoking some strong top-down control by the predators of the prey species and taken together you probably wouldn't expect to see any differences in biodiversity given that there's not really any destructive fishing techniques used on the GBR. You know, if you uh, contrast that with situations uh, in less developed, less wealthy countries, you know, they have um, artisanal or subsistence fisheries that um, target a vast range of the fish assemblage, um, and generally they probably use destructive fishing techniques. You get a lot more bang from your buck for throwing up a slip of dynamite in the water and scooping up dead fish than you do um, baiting a hook. And also there's less stringent controls over what's happening with coastal development. Um, and so we we'll probably then would expect to see, yes, we'll still get the enhancement of target uh, fish species, but uh, due to the, um, the destructive practices of many of the fishers, we'll probably see increased biodiversity inside marine reserves as long as they're um, well enough enforced and we'll also see some evidence of habitat protection. So... <clears throat> the rezoning in 2004 was a fairly um, contentious issue. It was a, a bold political move, um, and it certainly had uh, a little lobby groups up in arms about uh, the reduction of the amount of area that people could go fishing in. And so in that kind of context, I think it's really important that um, we're able to demonstrate that there were tangible benefits to uh, the expansion of the green zones that, um, you know, not only for the government, but that for, for the general public can actually appreciate that these things are doing what we're hoping that they can do. So basically that's what this study was set up to do. Um, and we tackled three large key questions. Firstly, did the green zones increase fish populations? And uh, we, get, we looked at both the uh, targets of the fishery and non-target species. Was there an increase in biodiversity? And finally, uh, do green zones um, convey any benefit to, uh, in the face of, of non-fisheries threats like large tropical cyclones or natural disturbances? So we undertook this project and it was done in collaboration, a loose collaboration at the start with uh, Dave Willey and his team here at the centre. We um, conducted underwater surveys of reef fishes and corals across a vast swath of GBR. Uh, the Ames LTMP team surveyed uh, 56 mid and outer shelf reefs of the GBR from just north of Cairns through five latitudinal sectors to the Capricorn bunkers at the southern end of the reef. Dave Willey uh, et al. had the unenviable task of jumping into the murk around these three um, inshore island groups and um, trying to count fish in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good laugh. The AMS LTMP, for those of you who don't know, we survey um, sites in a standard reef uh, reef slope habitat on the northeast flank of each reef to uh, enable valid spatial comparisons. Uh, within each of three sites, we have five permanently marked fixed transects, uh, which are then subsequently surveyed, as I said, for fish and benthic communities. We use standard underwater visual census techniques for the reef fishers and um, digital photography to quantify the benthos. Dave's team uh, use very similar techniques, although they still haven't reached the digital age and use um, point intercept transects, I believe, for the benthos. So um, very similar techniques used in both programs. 
I don't want to dwell on the statistical side of it too much, but there's a couple of things I just wanted to point out about um, this data set. First thing is I'm sure you can appreciate it's a very complicated sampling design uh, for the, uh, the Ames Offshore project. We have, as I said, five latitudinal sectors. Then within each sector there were uh, six reef pairs consisting of one um, green zone and then one reef open to fishing. And as I mentioned, the uh, intra-reef intra design is three sites and five transects at each site. And then the whole thing was repeated every second year since 2006. So it's quite an extensive data set. The other major issue we had with it was that um, the issue of zero inflation, particularly for the target predatory fish species. Um, these guys occur in relatively low abundances and um, I'm sure you can appreciate from this graph, which shows the uh, frequency of transects with the number of fish counted on transects. By far and away, the most frequently counted number of trout was zero. So um, this issue of zero inflation means that traditional statistical techniques um, had a really hard time dealing with it. We spent uh, six months, eight months, going through different ways trying to get um, sensible answers out of it. In the end, most of these just... Um, fell over and didn't want to play the game. So we ended up uh, using Bayesian hierarchical models. Um, these guys are quite, uh, quite flexible and they um, can implicitly deal with this issue of zero inflation by using uh, these appropriate error distributions. The other advantage to Bayesian models is that they do allow um, multiple post hoc comparisons without the attendant issues of uh, inflated type 1 error or loss of power, and for those who love p-values, you can still assign an actual probability of there being more trout in green zones compared to fish reefs, which you can use as a proxy for a p-value if you like. So I'll move on now to the results. Now, firstly, I'll talk about the, the primary target species of the fishery, the coral trout. So these are uh, the serranid group of fishes of the genus Plectropomus and Variola, which I don't have a photo of. Um, the fishes on the GBR all lump those guys together, so we did the same thing in the analysis and uh, just called them coral trout. This is the output from the Bayesian hierarchical models. There's a bit going on, so I'll just take a minute to walk you through it. The y-axis is all the different response variables that we modelled. The x-axis shows the effect size, and in this case it's the difference between the green and the blue expressed as a percentage of the blue. So anything to the right of this vertical line at zero means obviously more in the green zone, while anything to the left of the line is more in the blue. Uh, the data are the median output from the models, and the, uh, the dark symbols represent the data collected on the offshore reef, while the open symbols are Dave, Willie, Dave Willie's team's data, and the error bars are 95% uh, credible intervals. So you can infer statistical significance, if you like, where these error bars don't overlap the zero line. So, for the primary target species, we saw there was about a 50% increase in the density of these trout inside green zones compared to blue. They, they were uh, about 10% larger in size, and together this equated to almost a doubling of biomass inside green zones since 2004. So that's a really good result for the primary target species of the fishery and um, one that we would completely expect to see. So it's great to see that the data bears this out. For the secondary target species, um, these are the guys that aren't directly targeted by the fishers, but they will keep them if they catch them. We're talking about things like your snapper, your emperor, uh, and your other surrounded cods and wrasses. And the results weren't quite as clear-cut as what we saw for the primary targets. There was... Um, no real evidence of a change in density between green and blue, although there was actually a, about a 5 to 7% increase in the average length of these fishes in green zones compared to blue zones, and then this equated to about a 50% increase in biomass. So taken together, we can see that the, the rezoning since 2004 has done a really good job for the primary target species um, of the fishery, and it's exactly what we would have expected to have seen. So... Um, a big tick there. I should point out some uh, limitations to this data. Uh, this was a 
reactive monitoring program that we started two years after the rezoning occurred. So um, obviously it's hard to unequivocally attribute these changes directly to the rezoning. Um, but what we could do was use um, a suite of historical data which we held it together and then uh, modelled, and I'll get to that in just a minute. The other uh, point I'd like to raise is that the results I've shown you there are the time average GBR wide um, uh, results. There was uh, quite a bit of spatial and temporal variability to these results. For example, the um, cold trout biomass and the effect sizes, so the difference between green and blue, were much larger on the southern GBR than they were uh, in the northern sectors. Um, but that still uh, they, they still um, show the GBR-wide increases in, in trout numbers, and uh, it was definitely the southern end of the GBR that was driving those changes. Mike, can I just chime in briefly? Sorry. Um, just to add to your point there, the pairs of reefs that are the focus of this monitoring were very carefully selected and, and reviewed for all kinds of criteria to try to you know, make sure that everyone that was no a priori expectation of biases. But that was certainly a, a criticism that was levelled out of this project. Um, okay, so here's the uh, results, the output of the... We used, again, Bayesian hierarchical models to, um, to look at the temporal patterns. We got um, data from, graciously given to us by Tony Ayling uh, from the 1980s. He went out and surveyed about 200-odd reefs uh, up and down the length of the GBR. And um, you can see it's represented by this black square here. We then used um, the AIMS long-term monitoring data, which ran from um, 1996 uh, through to the rezoning and then every second year after. And you can see that's in the, uh, the circle symbols. And then finally, the dedicated RAP monitoring program is uh, the ones represented by the triangles. Um, green zones are the closed symbols, and those open to fishing are the open symbols. So in the 1980s, Coral trout biomass was sitting at around five kilos per thousand metres squared um, that we got from Tony's data. Sometime between the mid 80s and the mid 90s, there was a decline to about one and a half to two kilos per thousand metres squared, and this probably aligns well with uh, an expansion of the, the coral trout fishery, both commercial and recreationally. From the mid-90s through to the rezoning, when we were under the, uh, the first zoning plan with only 5% of the reef protected, we could already see that um, there were benefits to coral trout populations in the biomass was increasing, not only in the marine reserves, but also on reefs open to fishing. And that by about 1998, 99, there was a significant difference between biomasses in green and blue zones. So it showed that that level of protection was actually doing a good job. But then once the 2004 rezoning happened and the uh, area of green zones expanded to roughly 33%, we saw this incredible um, jump in coal trout biomass to, uh, well, I won't say historical highs, but the highest level that we've seen since we started monitoring the trout populations. And it was, it was quite a, uh, an astounding thing to see in such a short amount of time. Um, that biomass had jumped so significantly. Another thing I want to point out from this figure is that uh, many of the pundits predicted that um, given the expansion of the green zones post-2004, if fishing pressure had remained the same, you should see what they term the squeeze effect, and that would produce deleterious effects on trout populations in areas open to fishing. In fact, what we saw was exactly the opposite. Trout biomass inside um, fished reefs has actually increased substantially post-2004. So the final thing I want to really point out about this figure is the impacts of tropical cyclone Hamish, and I'll deal with this in a, a little more detail in a few minutes, but we can see that it did have really large impacts on trout populations on both uh, marine reserve reefs and those that are open to fishing. But uh, encouragingly, we've seen um, strong signs of recovery in the, in the few years since. So this is the, um, the GBR-wide patterns. Um, we had enough replication of reefs inside green zones and areas open to fishing that we could do this in each latitudinal sector. 
Um, so I'll show that to you now. And you can see that the patterns are fairly similar to what you see for the GBR wide. Um, one thing to point out is that um, this shows the spatial variability I was talking about in terms of um, the amount of biomass and uh, the effect sizes, like the difference between green and blue, is much greater in the southern GBR than it is in the northern GBR. Um, having said that, there's still um, differences, significant differences in biomass uh, in those northern sectors. There's one uh, sector that didn't uh, match this trend, the Palm Islands. Um, there was no real uh, evidence there of greater biomass in the green zones compared to the blue, and uh, we generally attribute this to probably uh, high levels of poaching given its proximity to the coast, but also um, probably some indigenous fishes as well getting in and amongst it. Uh, the final thing I really want to highlight is that uh, these models also allow you to then um, pull out the biomass ratio, the comparison of green to blue for each sector. And you can see that um, each sector, uh, <coughs> the biomass is much greater in the green zones compared to the blue zones, ranging between about two and four times the biomass. So taken all together, for the target species for coral trout, you can see that the expansion of the green zones in 2004 has worked really well. Um, as I mentioned before, it's no real surprise given that it's just, you know, these green zones just remove uh, that fishing pressure. And we have seen similar results elsewhere around the world and also within Australia. Um, there was, yep, that inherent spatial variation, but uh, it still meant that uh, at a GBR wide level we're seeing uh, real great benefit for our coral trout populations. Um, no squeeze effect was uh, also a good result and we put a lot of that down to um, probably the raft of management. Um, management implemented things like uh, licence buyback, so uh, instead of fishing effort actually increasing, it probably kept it somewhere near level and um, had no deleterious effect on trout populations inside blue zones. So given all that, hopefully we should begin to start seeing some uh, larval subsidies to surrounding fish areas, and I think Hugo and Jeff and colleagues uh, demonstrated this quite nicely a couple of years ago down in the Keppels. And the really neat thing about that result was that it showed that green zones can actually punch well above their weight. So they supply a lot more larvae to surrounding fished areas than um, given the proportion of area that they actually occupy. And the final point I want to make is we don't really have a handle on the effects of illegal fishing. It is a suggestion, particularly from that Palm Island um, sector that illegal fishing can perhaps um, quash these results, but um, we know it occurs, but we can't quantify the levels of it. Um, Dave's shown that you know, there's a build-up of fishing line in, in green zones once it's been removed, so it's definitely going on, but I think we need to try and get a better handle on how, exactly how bad the problem is. And talking to the compliance guys at Gabrumpa, certainly they've said in the last couple of years that um, prosecutions have certainly skyrocketed, so they seem to be getting on top of it. And so I can't really give you an indication of, of what effect that's actually had on these results, unfortunately. Anyway, we'll leave the uh, iconic trout and move on. I want to talk a bit about biodiversity, although I must confess we don't have a really good handle on that, and then talk about effects on um, non-target species. So um, using digital photography, it, uh, one of the downsides to that is that you can't really get good coral species identification. So we're unable to um, produce any coral species richness metrics. Um, and uh, what we went with in the end was uh, just hard coral cover, which is kind of a well-utilised metric for monitoring reefs. And I guess you could call it a very, very rough course um, proxy for diversity. And I think, as I said before, given there's no destructive techniques on the GBR, you probably wouldn't expect there to be a difference in hard coral between green zones and those open to fishing. And you'd probably you know, you'd be able to see nice little coral gardens irrespective of where you went. Although given the recent information, perhaps that's a bit more realistic about what we'd expect to see. OK, so same figure. Um, it does bear out that expectation that there is no difference in uh, any of the benthic 
metrics that we measured. Um, no great surprise, as I mentioned, because there's no destructive techniques, and um, that's about all I've got for that. We did, however, manage uh, to get uh, species level information for the fishes, so species richness is our metric for them. And you can see there's about a, a 5 to 7% increase in species richness of fishes on offshore green zones compared to the blue, but uh, we detected no real difference on the inshore reefs. Um, modern target species of fishes, so we divided this uh, analysis into functional groups um, and really there wasn't a lot that, that came out of it that jumped out to suggest that uh, non-target species uh, are benefited in any way from uh, increased protection. Uh, one interesting result is the detritivores, a group of acanthurids that are uh, about 40% uh, greater abundance in green zones. I don't have a great explanation for, for why that should be. Um, and also there was a slight increase in omnivorous damsel fishes and benthic foragers in green zones compared to blue on offshore reefs. Uh, we also thought it'd be a good idea to see if um, community structure was influenced by uh, zoning. So we ran um, a series of um, redundancy analyses on fish and benthic assemblages on both inshore and offshore reefs. Uh, rather than throw all that data at you at once, I thought I'd just walk you through this first panel, which is for the inshore fish assemblages. Um, one of the neat things about uh, constrained redundancy analysis is you can actually apportion the variation in assemblage structure due to the constrained uh, factors in your model. And in this case, we used island group and zone. And you can see that um, island group accounted for about 50% of the variation reef fish assemblage structure, but zoning only accounted for basically nothing. So there's absolutely no evidence in my mind there to suggest that zoning has any influence on community structure of reef fishes, and as I'll show you now, all benthic communities. So this is uh, the fish inshore and offshore, the benthic inshore and offshore, and in every case, uh, latitudinal sector or island group, I know the writing's very small, but you'll have to take my word for it, accounts for between 20 and 50% of the variation in assemblage structure, while um, the uh, zoning is always um, at about 0.01. So um, to my mind, no evidence there that uh, there's any influence of zoning on uh, assemblage structure and or diversity. Um, so just to summarise that section, there's really weak evidence of uh, increased diversity on offshore reefs, but no evidence for that on inshore reefs. Um, there were a few differences in, uh, in the benthic variables measured or the abundance of non-target species or community structure. Um, so to me, this says that um, there's probably <coughs> no top-down control being exerted by coral trout on, uh, on the prey species or the non-target species. And um, while on the face of it, it may seem like a slightly disappointing result, given that the wrapper zoning was um, based on uh, protecting biodiversity, this is exactly what you would expect uh, on the GBR, where fishers target relatively few species. The final section I want to talk about today is the uh, effects of a large-scale natural disturbance, in this case, Cyclone Hamish. Um, it was a, a really large Cat 4 5 system which came in from the Coral Sea in 2009. Uh, took a, a rather unusual path for cyclones in this part of the world in that it um, ran basically the length of the GVR and definitely affected the bottom third. Most cyclones tend to track east to west and you know, thereby limit the damage that uh, is caused, but Hamish managed to cause a large swathe of destruction across this bottom third of the reef which is really unfortunate for all the reefs in that area, but it was great for us because we could then apply a before-after control impact paired uh, designed to the data to get at the effects of uh, Cyclone Hamish. So basically we treated reefs in these two northern sectors, the Townsend Wind Cairns, as the controls. They lay outside the destructive wind belts um, and didn't appear, uh, certainly from observation, to have been impacted that badly by Hamish. <coughs> 
and then the, the reefs of the southern GBR, the Pompey, the Swains and the Cap Bunkers, uh, we all called impact reefs as they lay within the wind belt. Uh, apart from the bunkers, which is just outside, but we included them as impact reefs because they were um, definitely exposed to the large swell generated by this big storm. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the results of uh, the models for this. Uh, again, it's a similar figure to what you've seen previously, all the response variables. On the y-axis, we split it into the control and the impact reefs. Um, and the effect size on the x-axis, instead of the difference between green and blue, it's now the difference before and after tropical cyclone Hamish. Um, the years 2006-2008 were treated as before, uh, and 2010-2012 were after. Uh, and we only ran this analysis on the offshore reefs, as we thought there were probably limited uh, impacts on the inshore. Um, so the, uh, the symbols are now, instead of inshore, offshore, they're green zones and fished for the, um, the black and the open circles. So uh, no surprises, there was a large reduction in hard coral cover across those impact reefs, about 50% compared to no change in the control area, with a concomitant increase of algae of about the same amount and no um, evidence of any happening in the Townsville and Cairns control area. Um, totally expected, you wouldn't imagine um, that green zones are going to do anything to mitigate these type of effects. So just to visually show you, uh, this is one of the outer reefs in the Pompey sector. It had a thriving hard soft coral community before um, tropical cyclone Hamish. This is exactly the same transect after it and you can see that uh, community has just been completely wiped out, replaced by algae. And uh, probably a more visually appealing one is this one from the Cap Bunkers um, that had these lush gardens of Acropora removed uh, by the storm and stripped back to bare substrate. So what sort of impacts did that have for uh, the fish species? I think after the storm went through, there was uh, people who were inundated with calls from fishermen up and down the coast saying that now. And I think it's uh, clearly shown here that the, the density of trout had in fact declined quite significantly even on those shallow reefs um, by about 50%. Uh, there was no evidence of a change in the length, the average length of these fishes after the storm. But uh, one of the intriguing results for me from this study was uh, even though biomass was lost, by about 50% on uh, fished reefs, there was uh, strong evidence to suggest that there's no such change in the biomass of fishes in green zones. So this is a fairly surprising result um, and suggests that maybe these green zones can offer something in the way of resistance or resilience to these target populations. I think what's probably happened is that um, trout were larger in the green zones prior to the storm and that somehow this is... Uh, Inferred some sort of, uh, they were better able to, to cope with the, the effects of the storm, or they were, their larger size meant they could move more readily into and out of the impact area. Um, and it did, of course, it, it was surprising to us, but it was even more surprising to some of the journalists around. Well, certainly gave them some fodder, but at least uh, the Cairns Post got things factually right in the article. <laughs> <laughs> um, the secondary target species, we saw no uh, evidence of any real change in the density length of biomass of these species. And then for the uh, non, so for the diversity of fishes, there was a slight uh, decline, about a 5% decrease in fish species richness uh, following the storm with uh, no change in the control area. And then um, and this has been shown before, some of the uh, functionally important groups like the scraping parrotfishes increased in abundance following the storm, likely due to the increase in algae. Um, and another little intriguing result is this um, planktivorous fishes increased by about 60%. Uh, from our data, this is, um, this is mainly damsel fishes as we don't count seasionids. Uh, um, and a lot of these planktivorous damsel fishes are really closely associated coral, so uh, what, what's going on there? 
So what I think's happened is um, this is largely driven by massive increases of one species, Pomocentris celestis, in the cat bunkers. Uh, it's been documented to happen uh, previously. I think Alfred et al. Um, in 2004 noted this, that once you strip away the coral cover in the bunkers, these guys just go, the populations go through the roof. So I think that's what's explaining um, that spurious pattern there. Um, and then we did see some declines in there in the usual suspects that you would expect the guys that are associated very intimately with hard coral cover, like the obligate corallivores. Obviously, once you take their food away, um, they're in a world of pain. Um, and the benthic foragers, which is your other, um, other ketodons and some wrasses and some omnivorous damselfishes as well. So <clears throat> just to sum that up, obviously green zones offer no direct protection from cyclones. But the fact that we did have this large network of uh, green zones spread across the GBR meant that there were unaffected reefs. Larger trout on green reefs obviously had larger survivorship. Um, and together, I think this means that we're going to see uh, the potential for a, for a fairly fast recovery given that we've got sources for resetting these damaged reefs and the impacted and depleted populations. And I've actually gone much quicker than I've ever done this talk before, but uh, <coughs> we'll just wrap the whole thing up now, and um, hopefully there's still a few beers left. The, I think we can say that the, the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in 2004 has done exactly what we would have expected it to do, given the, um, the regional setting in which it's found. Uh, we saw um, large increases in targeted fish species, but no real changes to um, biodiversity. <clears throat> this suggests that, yes, there's definitely adequate protection for coral trout stocks. Uh, and I think there was also adequate protection in the previous zoning plan, but um, certainly the expansion has um, done wonders for those trout stocks, and we've even seen um, great effects on reefs that are still open to fishing. Also suggests that uh, the catch is currently sustainable, which is probably good news, and, and mesh as well with the... Um, the stock assessment report that came out, I think, last year by um, fisheries. Um, <clears throat> the crude measures of biodiversity we've used, obviously these need to be refined and um, dealt with in a much more rigorous way. Uh, but um, I think it's encouraging that even though there's no differences, again, you would, wouldn't have really expected differences in biodiversity uh, given this, the setting of the GBR. Another way of looking at it is that at least we're not seeing declines in diversity in, uh, in areas open to fishing. So um, I think it's currently doing the job we're hoping for. And I think, you know, the green zones, we've seen they can be successful, but they're really they're not the solution to all the threats that are facing coral reefs today. And I think that example of Cyclone Amy shows that quite nicely. You know, these connected networks are definitely going to contribute to making sure we've got reefs into the future, but we're really going to have to take effective measures to, um, to reduce land-based threats and particularly um, stopping uh, nutrients reaching the GBR and also um, increasing levels of carbon dioxide and its attendant problems with climate change and acidification. And just the final point to note is that, you know, this study just focused on shallow reefs like habitats. We don't know what's going on really anywhere else, particularly all those interreefal habitats. You've got sponge gardens, you've got seagrass beds. So we really need, <coughs> pardon me, to get a, a much better handle on um, other ecosystems apart from coral reefs. And I think I'll um, leave it there. There's the article that came out, if you haven't seen it last year, in current biol. And um, yeah, thanks very much for listening and I'll take any questions.